open to First Chronicles chapter 4. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9. Some of you are very familiar with this passage, probably have it memorized. Some of you are still trying to find First Chronicles. <laughs> and that's okay. Holy Spirit, you are here. You are welcome. God, I add my word of thanks and joy over that testimony we just heard. I incorporate that, Lord, under the unction of the Holy Spirit into this word that's going to be shared. As Pastor Greg declared, you are a God who hears us, and you are a God who answers prayer which is why we will never relent to draw near to you. And we love you. In Jesus' name. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out, to the God of Israel. Oh, say that with me. Oh, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. I've been wanting to share a word on this theme with this community, this, this English dominant community for some time. And in God's great providence that I do not deserve, he, he permitted me to bring this word this week. And I, this is... This is amazing because as Pastor Greg was sharing uh, in his time of an announcements today, this has been a week, particularly for this church, the Congregation Line of Judah. Indeed, it's been a season saturated in prayer. All this week, Leon de Judá has been host to the, to the first five days of an event called the 10 Days of Prayer. What that means for us is that a group of students from YWAM, uh, a ministry called Youth with a Mission, and other ministries have been living in our fourth floor right upstairs from us, worshiping and praying around the clock 24-7, and people from churches and ministries throughout the region dropping in night and day, praying. Praying. It was a preview of heaven up there. I, one particular night, I, I, it occurred to me, I told Pastor Greg, you know, the other night I was up at 3 a.m., I should have dropped in for prayer. They were up and about. After our Wednesday night service uh, uh, in the original sanctuary, I popped in. It was like 10, 15, 10, 30. There was one young lady. I was the only soul there. But that's not what's impressive. What's impressive is a minute before I walked in, there was just this one young lady with her guitar worshiping the Lord as if she was leading an entire Passion or Hillsong conference. Worshiping God as if there was a multitude in front of her. And the presence of the Lord was so thick and wonderful, saturated and sweet. All you needed to do was just sit there, open your pores, and let the anointing of the Lord just seep in to every avenue. It was amazing. And it was here. 
All this is leading up, as Pastor Greg was sharing, to Wednesday's event in Northfield, where prayer warriors from throughout the Commonwealth will be gathering in the middle of nowhere. Have you seen them? Have you Googled where this is? In the middle of nowhere. These are the, some of the few w- roads in Massachusetts that still have watch out for the bears, deer crossing. In the middle of nowhere, we're gathering to pray some, by hundreds. They're expecting maybe even a thousand souls to spend hours together in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day, to pray And this isn't just Pentecostals and Evangelicals. A group of Greek Orthodox students, Greek Orthodox students, dropped by our prayer service last Wednesday night, drinking it in, drinking it in, mingling their prayers with ours, with those folks. Imagine Greek Orthodox students preparing for the priesthood, worshiping the Lord in the same room with with YWAM, Pentecostals, and Evangelicals. Because prayer is is essential to every Christian tradition, Catholic, Orthodox, every flavor of Protestant. If you're looking for something in common in all of Christendom, it is prayer. No Christian soul can live long without it. Why? Why is this so indispensable? So let's look at prayer. Let's take time to understand its power and embrace it and harness it and unleash it in Jesus' name. And for me, this passage that that leaps out of the pages of a list of, if you read the rest, and I do encourage you to read the rest of Chronicles, but this particular chapter, particularly in the King James, uh, is one of those wonderful who begat whom kinds of passages. Who begat whom? Uh, Out of the middle of this chapter leaps this story that I believe serves as a primer on prayer. What has come to us to be known as the prayer of Jabez. The simple passage, two verses, verses 9 and 10, give us at least three reasons why we pray. Very basic. There's three reasons why this is so important. Number one, he is a God who answers prayer. He is a God who answers prayer. Number two, he is the God who expands our territory and shields us from pain. He is the God who expands our territory and shields us from pain. And number three, he is the God who changes us and makes us honorable. He's the God who changes us and makes us honorable. First of all, one of the obvious things that comes out of this scripture and why it has so much power is because it reminds our souls that our God is the God who answers prayer. Prayer begins, why, why do we do this? Is it some relic of, some, uh, of uh, some ancient, you know, what, Freudian release, some catharsis? Just another form of meditation? It could, I mean, it could be. It may have that byproduct. But the reason we pray is because we begin with the assumption that there's a loving and powerful God on the other end of that prayer. With his ear turned to your prayer and with his heart opened to your prayer, listening. It's his passion. It's what he loves. It's if heaven had a hobby, this is God's hobby. 
This is his pastime. He creates the heavens and the earth, and then he tunes his ear to listen to what rises from there. And the word, scripture says that for him, the Bible says our prayers rise before him. The book of Revelation calls it incense. Incense. Somehow, between the prayers that we pray here and the throne of God, that, that just metabolizes into a fragrance that God inhales and inherits, inserts into his heart. Hallelujah. He listens. And he responds. Now, I would argue that if you're here in this sanctuary this morning, on this soggy Columbus Day Sunday, God's already answered your prayer. It's already an answered prayer. You want evidence that God is hearing you? You want evidence that God is listening to you? You are here. Now, hey, Pastor Sam, that's really sweet. But I don't remember, I don't, I don't, I don't remember praying to be here. In fact, my game got rained out, and my friend called me, and I had nothing better to do, and he caught me, and I had no excuse, so here I am. I say, I rest my case. God heard you. And that's why you're here. He says, well, Pastor Sam, I, I, I don't know if I know how to pray. Well, here's the deal. Over time, we've turned prayer into a rhetorical exercise, a kind of speech. You know, uh, uh, and, and you listen, you know, hard to some of us. Please don't ever, don't mimic Pastor Sam, because Pastor Sam doesn't want to mimic Pastor Sam, or Pastor Greg, or Pastor Roberto. You'd be surprised what God calls prayer. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed what the Lord considers prayer. Because for God, it, prayer is much more instinctual and much more primal, almost biological. It's almost as if you cannot help but pray. In fact, in this passage, it's not even a word. It's an exclamation. Oh, can you believe that? It's not even a word. And God hears that. The word says that God hears the cry of our hearts. The Bible says in Psalm 34 that the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. Uh, later in Romans, Another passage reads, and the same, in the same way, the Spirit, with a capital S, helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Pastor Sam, I'm clueless. Half the time I come before God, I don't even know where to get started. I have no idea. Jews who grew up praying since they were, you know, infants and learning to speak, had to ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. Because they saw that he was doing something that they were not capable of doing. He was doing something completely. This man was actually praying. And so the Spirit of the Lord helps us in our weaknesses. He assumes that we do not know. He assumes that we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Some translations say the Spirit of the Lord intercedes with our spirit, with a little s, with groans that words cannot express. When the Lord created you, he put inside you an organ, a spiritual organ known as the Spirit. Because you were made in the likeness 
an image of your heavenly Father, and he made sure as he breathed into you that there would be an instrument that exists for and only for communication between your heart and the heart of the Father. And that's known as your spirit. That's known of your spirit. And there's this constant transaction between your spirit and the spirit of the living God. Interesting. Scripture doesn't say Jabez prayed. It says, what's it say? It says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. You know, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me if the only actual word of that prayer was that, oh. It wouldn't surprise me if that was the only thing the man actually got out, if the only thing he actually said. And every other thought was transmitted in that, oh. It was packaged in sconce. He put a FedEx label on it and sent it to the Lord directly from Job as his spirit to the Spirit of God. Because you could pack a lot in that O. You can pack a lot in that O. And, you know, you've probably prayed that prayer more than you realize or imagine. You were bewildered. Maybe I'm just talking about myself. But maybe you were bewildered when that O came out of your spirit. Maybe you were perplexed when that O came out of you. You were terrified. You were afraid. You were alone. You were needing a solution, needing an exit, needing an answer, needing a healer, needing a savior. And the best you could do in that instant was your spirit to call out to the Spirit of God with that, oh, maybe even an, oh, my God. I have news for you. The Lord heard you. The Lord heard you. The Lord has been hearing you. All this time, he has been hearing the cry of your heart. And that's probably why you're here. That is probably why you're here. Because the Spirit of the God has been calling to your spirit too. The Spirit of God has been communicating with your spirit too. As well, he's been drawing you. He's been drawing you here. He's been drawing you near. Uh, David writes in Psalm 27, You have said, seek my face to my heart. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. And on this soggy Monday, Sunday morning before Columbus Day, here you are, at the congregation line of Judah, maybe in your spirit, as, as you maybe it wasn't your intention, but man, now that you're here and they say, raise your hands. I don't want trees raising them any higher than me, Lord. I don't want stones speaking any louder than me, Lord. And that something got to you. I said, might as well. I might as well. You know, you know, no one's watching. No one's thinking. Everyone's focused on, on this stuff. I might as well just pray. It says, Lord, let your hand be on me. Lord, bless me. Lord, extend my territory. Lord, free me from pain. Shield me. From harm. And the Lord's been hearing you. And as you do, 
cry out to God, inhaling and inhaling his grace, exhaling your spirit to God. Literally, the, the, the church fathers had this thing called breath prayers. Literally, they, they got it. While they're washing dishes, while they're, while they're, you know, while, while they're planting uh, seeds in their basil garden, while, you know, while they're in the marketplace, while they're walking the earth, they would breathe in God's grace, and they would breathe out prayers to the Lord. They called them breath prayers. The medieval fathers, they called them breath prayers. And you've been, maybe you've done a little of that. You've been praying these breath prayers. And, and you find yourself in the house of God praying these breath prayers. And as you do, sooner or later you're going to discover this. Which brings us to our, our second revelation from this word. Ours is the God who expands our territory. As you cry out to God, you'll discover that he expands our territory and he shields us from pain. Nelson, thank you for your testimony. As I was preparing this word, I discovered that the most efficient and effective way to illustrate this was through a testimony. Demonstrating God's power to expand our testimony and bless us. I do have permission to share this testimony. I'm going to read it verbatim so that I don't say more than I need to. You all know that as we did today, following our time of worship, this church opens the altar for anyone who wants to draw near to God. If you're new to this church, you'll find that we do that in each service. We call it the time of intercession. It's called different things in different churches. Whatever you call it in other churches, ministry time, they call it in other churches, it's fine. The, what we call it isn't important. The fact is, we pause. We pause and we say, now, Lord, just come, minister, hug your bride, bridegroom, and come forward and, and come and, and pray. A woman began attending our church about a, a year, maybe even a, a year and a half ago. Not long. When she first arrived, as, as the, is the case with so many of us, and this is cool, so I'm giving you permission for, for this. If, this. if you're in this season, God bless you. You're where you need to be. Because when she first arrived, she was a regular face at the altar. She was one of those, uh, you know, Anonymous faces at the altar at Lion of Judah during prayer time. And I say that because, like so many others, she would come and she would weep. And when, as also the tradition, you know, the ministers and the elders and pastors will come and will lay hands on people when we... And I, I want to let you in on something, all right? Make this clear. When we pray with and for those who come forward to pray, the, man, the ministers and the pastors here, we're not mind readers. We're, we're not mind readers. I want to make that clear. At times, God gives us flashes of a revelation, like lightning flashing a painting on a wall. And, and you see something for a moment, and then it's gone. And, and the Holy Spirit can guide us on how to pray for this soul in front of us. But most of the time, without talking to people, you have no idea what they're going through or what their world is like. You have no idea. Only much later, after, after so much stuff, would I learn this woman's story. Not long before coming to Leon de Judá, she arrived from the Dominican Republic, abandoned by her husband, facing the world alone with her daughter and her aging mother. Truth is, I could be talking about a hundred women in this congregation. She was the only wage earner of those three. She spoke next to nothing of English. She had a high school degree 
from the Dominican Republic. So she took whatever job she could, working for employers that knew this and exploited her. So she came to the altar because she was out of options. So I imagine, I imagine as she came forward and opened her heart to God between sobs without realizing it, she prayed the prayer of Jabez. It just naturally flows from our hearts, Lord. As we're laying hands on her, her spirit is crying out, Lord, let your hand be with me. Lord, keep me from harm. Keep my daughter from harm. Keep my mother from harm. Free us from pain. Bless us. God began to bless her. God began to bless her. God began to expand her, her territory. Just, it, just, it, was, it was just this one of these, and, I, and this is also, I could also be talking about a hundred different women in this congreg congregation because I've seen God do this over and over again. Led by the Spirit, she began taking steps of faith. She enrolled in the Boston Herx ESOL class. Then, you know, emboldened by the grace and favor, she says, you know, and, and, and I'm imagining with each step of faith, you know, Lord, let your hand be with me. Lord, let your hand be with me. So she, her next step is, wow, Lord, if, you, if your hand was there with, it, with me there, I'm going to enroll in community college. So God, let your hand be with me. Bless me now. Expand my territory, expand the world in front of me, took that step. I'm enrolling in community college. I'm going to finish my degree. So she enrolls in community college. She, she, she casts her eye in another direction. The Lord shows her another territory. She, you know, she ditches that job. I remember her coming and actually speaking up for the first time. In six months, I, I, heard, heard, I heard this woman's voice. And says, Pastor Sam, and she was telling me her about, about her job. And I said, woman, woman of God, you do as God led, leads you. Now she's, got, now she's got what recent college grads would call a real job. A real job. And God just continued. Her, his hand was on her. Is on her. Expanding her territory. Blessing her. It wasn't long before... This sister approached Pastor Roberto with a request, and it was a doozy. Her daughter, a smart, winsome 14-year-old, had been bullied so badly in her public high school that she literally withdrew herself from school. What do you mean, Pastor Sam? I'm saying that her daughter was home. What do you mean she was home? She had locked herself up in her room, in her home, for the better part of a year, that whole time barely seeing the light of day, battling depression, and God knows what other demonic powers imprisoning this girl's mind. Pastor went, prayed with her. God healed her and freed that little girl's mind. She's now a regular at the youth group. She's a regular at Radical Culture, making friends who love Jesus. This fall, she enrolled in a Christian high school, and for the first time in almost two years, she's sitting in a classroom like any other teenage girl. You'd have no idea what God had done. No idea. There are miracles sitting in this in front of me. 
who have testimonies of being ra- virtually raised from the dead. Who, you have testimonies of your minds being freed from madness. You have testimonies of the Lord gluing your marriage together with scotch tape. You have testimonies of the Lord healing you when, the, when folks said there was no hope for you or no healer. God hears our cry. God listens to the cry of the righteous. He blesses us and he expands our territory, which is why he is worthy of glory, which is why we worship and praise him. We cry out and he heals us. We cry out and he heals us. We cry out and he rescues us. We cry out, he provides a roof over our heads and food on our table and removes our despair. He listens to our cry and blesses those who depend on him, those who look to his hand. But I have an, I have an admonition for you, an urge for you, and it's, this is, listen here. If you stop there, if we stop there, you're shortchanging yourselves. We're shortchanging ourselves. You have tasted. So some of y'all are in that stage. Some of y'all are still crying out to God. You have no clue why you're here. Others, you know why you're here. You know what God has done for you. You know what you owe God. And you're here blessing the Lord. Praise God for that. But there's another level. There's another place. There's more territory. If you stop there, you're shortchanging yourself. You, this group I'm talking to, has tasted. And you have seen that God is good. That's why you're here. That's why you're a worshiper of the living God. But whatever you're seeking from his hand bears no comparison to God's true target. His true purpose for bringing you here. And what he's got his eyes on is your unseen heart. What he has his design on is your eternal destiny. Because God, our God, is the God who reinvents us. He's the God who changes us. He's the God who makes us honorable. That's his game. This passage begins with what I believe is God's end game for us. The simple two-verse passage. And that first sentence, like any good essay, begins with the end in mind. It's the, theme, it's the reason, what, it's what draws you in, right? You're drawn into these two verses like you're drawn into a, 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 a masterpiece novel. And that first, that first verse is this. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying... I gave birth to him in pain. Something you should know. The Hebrew word translated there, more honorable, means to bear up under anything. More honorable means to endure adversity. He was made tougher, more resilient, more likely to survive, Whatever hell threw at him, he was more honorable. He could bear up under anything, endure adversity. And when it says, than his brothers, this isn't necessarily Jabez's physical siblings. It could have been. But it's not necessarily his actual brothers and sisters. But that he stood out from his people. He stood out from his generation. Perhaps an entire generation born in pain. 
who had a perfect excuse to stay in pain. And you don't know who those people are. But you know who Jabez is. You know who Jabez is because he stood out from that generation. God, listen, I, I hear that the Lord would have given up heaven if it were for but one soul. Now, I, thank God he had more faith than that. But the truth is this. The Lord, what, is, what was it that he said to Moses? I can make a nation out of you. I can make a nation out of you. I could, I could turn the stones into a people if I wanted to. He is fine if your entire high school, if your entire neighborhood, if the entire city of Boston went south and you stood as the only honorable believer in the living God, he's fine with that. He's fine with that. He is with you. Do you understand this? His interest is to find those who are willing to stand out from among the people, to stand out from this generation, to stand out from those others born in pain and say, ding, don't mind me, but I'm getting off this bus because this is not God's plan for me. This is not for you, not you. God wants to rewrite the script of your life from the inside out. And that's why you're here. He wants to make you impervious to anything Satan can throw at you. And that's why you're here. How? Well, I'm glad you were excited a minute ago because there's no, pro there's no magic to this process. This will take work. It requires spending quality time with the Lord. Getting to know Him. Allowing His presence to shape you. In other words, that means prayer. Now be encouraged. What I've just shared is you already have the instinct of prayer. Be encouraged as you walk into your prayer closet alone. You know that God hears you. The cry of, you, you know that, in fact, I think words don't matter much in prayer. Words are inferior to your spirit speaking to the spirit of God. So you already have, be encouraged. Don't let Satan lie to you now. Don't let him steal this word off of you. You know perfectly well how to pray, just like you know perfectly well how to eat, and you know perfectly well how to walk, and you know perfectly well how to sleep. You know how to pray. It's instinctual. But like with, with, like with any, any other discipline, it's like, you know, this is like working out now. This is like study habits now. You know, we have a, a wedding coming up in Punta Cana, reluctantly. <laughs> Not the wedding, it's the Punta Cana part. You know, I'm just thinking of that beach and, you know, six-pack abs are costly. <laughs> they are costly. They take work. To acquire. It's like any discipline. God, the Holy Spirit, you know, y'all know, those of you who are in school, you know, y'all know the Holy Spirit isn't going to magic. If you haven't studied all month, the Holy Spirit ain't going to magically give you an A the next day. Even if you fasted and prayed like the whole week, ain't going to happen. It's going to record. This is, folks, this is discipline. And no discipline is fun. At times, when you're doing this, let me warn you, it's going to feel cold. It, it may feel like God is nowhere to be found. Press in. Press in. There are important things that happen through these times of prayer between your spirit and the invisible spirit of God, 
whether or not you see the heavens open, and whether or not you hear angels sing, whether or not you hear t- feel tingles, this is important. There are things that are happening that almost have nothing to do with what you actually say. First of all, for instance, the very act of setting the time, and I'm going to share about four, I literally have a list of four things that happen in this time alone with prayer, of prayer and, and, and why this is so important. Number one, the very act of setting a time apart devoted to communicating with God, whether that is 10, 15 minutes before you run out to the bus or grab your, your coffee and go to your car and, and, and hit the road, or 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour, you know, and then you trade up and you're actually, you end up coming to the Wednesday night service or, 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 or you're, you know, you're, you t- you're taking a half day to go to the north field. What, Pastor Sam, what do I get out of that? You know what? It might actually be a fabulous blessing if you don't get diddly squat out of that. You know why? The very fact that you set that time apart and devoted it. You know what devoted means in the Old Testament when you read that? You incinerated it. You offered it to God. You, you wrapped the, old, the most precious offering in this day and age that you can give to God is your time. You know, you're, we're a little, you know, finding a lamb in your backyard or an ox or what have you is a little hard to come by. But what we are wrapping at the, what, you know, what we're wrapping at the altar now and burning before God is our time. I, I the folk at Herc, they're, I drive them nuts with this. Because we're beholden to this living God. We're religious nuts. We're beholden to this living God. At 1.30 in the afternoon, someone rings a bell. No emails. No texting. No, no proposals. No lesson plans. For whatever it takes, 10, 15 minutes, we've just incinerated. We're nev- you're never going to get that time back. It's gone. You gave it, you gave it to God. And just by doing that, you're saying, you, you are in charge. You, you are the boss. You are my priority. And you go back to your life. But by faith, by faith, you're saying, I gave my God that 10, 15 minutes, that 20 minutes, that half hour, that hour. Te lo entrego, Señor. Te lo dedico, Señor. Te lo ofrezco, Señor. Te lo quemo, Señor. Lo convierto en cenizas. I reduce it to ashes for the glory of your name. It does something else, too. And you're beginning to see this process already. Number, the second thing it does is it humbles us. In business, they have a, a phrase. It right-sizes us. You know, when your supervisor starts talking about right-sizing, put your resume together. That means, they're, you know, they're shrinking the place down. We're going to right-size our operations division. I, if you're in the operations, <laughs> you know what's coming. It right-sizes us. It puts us in the right relationship between us and our Creator. Because at first, you can find yourself alone in your room. I don't know how many of you have been through this process already. Pastor Sam, I find myself alone in my room. And, you, and at first, you have no idea. Pastor Sam, it's just like Roman says, you have no idea. You have no idea how to pray. It sounds like something like this. He says, Lord, I'm here speaking to you in an empty room. I'm here by faith. I'm here because my soul cannot live without you. And your mind is saying, this is nuts. (laughs) I mean, really, who am I talking to? This chair, the painting on the wall, who am I talking to? That's a good thing. 
Stay in there a little while. Keep talking to the chair. Keep talking to the chair. All right? Keep talking to the, cal- to the calendar on the cal- Keep talking to them. Why? Because in that time, you're going to begin to feel your smallness. Your smallness. In that time, if, here's the irony. You're actually, you might even feel more helpless, more fragile, more silly. Your mind at this point is what you're sacrificing. You are laying down your mind. That this is nuts. It's saying, God, you're greater than my mind. My mind cannot conceive of you. I, I, I am a, and, and then, in place of your smallness, you begin to believe him when he says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You come to take comfort in his greatness, in his Now you know what we mean by his presence. By his presence. You begin to cultivate in that space alone an awareness of his presence. Because something happens after a while. This may not even happen the first time you're in that room alone. It may, may not happen the second time you're in that room alone. It may not happen the first week that you're in that room alone. Something happens that you run out of words. and You run out of ideas. You don't know what to say. You're sitting in that same room, hopefully with a Bible on your lap, some music going. And all of a sudden, you're not alone. Your spirit knows it. Your spirit knows it. You know, you're getting these ideas, these senses. It's not definitely, that's not Sam speaking to me now. Your heart just, it's like, it's like warm syrup. Someone like someone just poured maple syrup over your heart. It's amazing. And there's no one, you know, do I hear anything? Is there music? Where's that music coming from? Where's this, where's this peace coming from? Did someone light incense? It's just you. But unless you allow yourself to feel the smallness, you, unless you fight that battle, you're not going to experience the greatness. The greatness. Which brings us maybe to the third point. Not only does it right-size you, but it right-sizes our challenges and puts our life's drama in perspective. As we sort out our concerns, we lay them out. You know, don't be, just, he wants to hear you complaining. He does. He wants to hear it. I mean, lay out, what is it that you're afraid of? What is it that's keeping you up at night? What is this death-defying disaster that you don't want to face? That you you don't even want to think about? This thing that if it should happen to you would deprive you of who you are. Why don't you line that up like little freight trains? Pull them out of the cave. Your worries, your fears, your anxieties, your desires. And as we give them names and lay them at his feet, their power over us weakens. As you name them, as you face them, as you lay them before God. And you know, you're going to find yourself saying sooner or later, you know, this isn't so bad. Even as we pray, we may already see a solution or awaken to a strategy, even even before you get up and walk out the door. Very often, I've laid these things before the Lord. I jump in the shower because I've, you know, I've got life to face. I'm standing in the shower. Boom. The Lord answers. A strategy comes to my mind. A door opens. You know, some, and I, that, that's almost, I count on that. That's my, you know, that's, that's my business strategy. Um, <laughs> Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your heart and your mind. In Christ Jesus. 
Now, this one last thing. Philippians 4, what does that mean by with thanksgiving? I want to lay this emphasis and we can all go home. With thanksgiving, oh my gosh. There is no more effective faith builder than to include in your prayer sometime when we complete this sentence. Lord, thank you for dot, dot, dot. Lord, thank you for. I've, actually, I've turned it into a little game. For real. You know, I, I try to thank the Lord. I've learned to thank the Lord for the most minimal. Well, the, you're going to hear. There's no such thing as a minimal. Lord, thank you for this parking space in the South End. How's that? Lord, thank you for perfect weather for this walk along the bike trail. Lord, thank you that my windshield wipers work on this Sunday morning. Lord, thank you for this space you've provided for me to be alone with him. And you know what you're doing? With this, you're looking for the fingerprints of God. You're looking for his pheromone signature in your life. And you realize, wow, God is with me. Wow, God has heard my cry. And then you get bolder. Lord, Thank you for healing my brother of stage four cancer. True story. Lord, thank you for parents who love me. Lord, and, and who taught me to love you. Lord, thank you for a church that exalts your name and, and the privilege of spending my days in your courts. I still can't believe it. And then you begin to believe if God could do that, what can't God do? But more importantly, you begin to appreciate God's presence, his active influence, his silhouette in your life. And not only you. As we thank God for one another, you know that phrase, Lord, thank you for? Fill in people's names. Lord, thank you for my brother. Lord, thank you for my sister, my neighbor, my office mate, my boss, my teacher, my husband, my wife my kids, my pastor. Lord, thank you. And you start naming these folks. This is now called intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer, where your focus isn't yourself anymore, it's someone else. Something amazing happens. You can't help but begin to love them. God, teach me to love people. You know how he does that? Amen. You know how he does that? Love becomes freer. As you're praying for them, the Holy Spirit shows you images. Pray for this for this person. Lift this up about this other person. Lift this up about your roommate. Then a name comes to your head that you hadn't thought about in months. And the Lord says, text him. Call her. Reach out to him. Before long, you begin to realize that God has not only heard your cry, but you're somebody else. In that process, he's framed you, he's shaped you, he's changed you. You could count on his presence even if you don't see him or hear him. And God begins to use you, channeling his grace and his power and his love through you. You don't just become a recipient of God's grace and mercy. Where you want to go is a place where you begin to transmit to a hungry generation his power. And in Jesus' name, if you would dare to do that, if you walk into that phase, if you accept that challenge, many will call you blessed. And many will call you honorable. Many will be blessed by the very sight of you. Many will recognize that you walk with God, that you know his name, and that you are known by him. If that's what you want from God, 
If that's what you want from God, He's going to grant your requests. He's going to grant your requests. If that's the desire of your heart, God's going to make sure to make it happen. Let's bow our heads now before the Lord's presence. Crying out to God and in prayer. Just say this with me. Lord, hear the cry of my heart. Take me. Inhabit me. I ask that you bless me. I ask that you stretch out my territory before me. I ask that you lift up my eyes to the hills that I may see my life as you see. Merciful Father, shield me from harm. Free me from pain. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name.